I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Jimit Arora, partner, leads Everest Group's practice focused on training enterprise customers. This responsibility spans Everest Group's research offerings focused on executives in IT, sourcing and vendor management and shared services. Rohit Ashwa Agarwal, Vice President, is a leader in Everest Group's global sourcing practice. In his role, Rohit Ashwa is focused on engagements and initiatives with global companies that focus on GBS shared service centers. Amir Khan, senior analyst, is a part of Everest Group's enterprise talent excellence practice. In his role, Amir is focused on engagements and projects that focus on key aspects of talent research. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Rohit Ashwa. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for making time to dial in today. We are excited to be talking to all of you. Uh, it's a very interesting topic that we are covering today. And uh, in the last uh, few weeks, we have received several questions uh, from, uh, from our clients, from other practitioners in the industry about the talent situation. And like, if, if you've been following the current financial and economic situation, I believe most of you have, this is a very curious situation and it's curious from many different angles, unprecedented, hard to explain events are happening. And that, that trend is continuing in the talent market as well. And that's the topic today, right? The, the scarcity, while we are seeing a lot of layoffs. So along with my colleagues today, the key questions we'll try to answer are, as we see a lot of layoffs and expectations of uh, you know, the reduction in demand supply gap, which segments of talent will likely to experience, are likely to experience shortages still. We very importantly want to talk about mistakes that industry should avoid in situations like these, uh, because that can, uh, the follow through can be fairly catastrophic. And most importantly, we are going to lean into more constructive uh, strategies around what should you be doing to build a future-proof, sustainable talent pipeline. So that, that's the broad agenda for today. The way we are going to do it is uh, we are going to divide the session today into four parts. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see how these four parts will look like. So we are going to start by looking at some facts, hardcore facts, market situation as of today, to simply take stock of the situation. Is the war for talent over? We're going to then move on and talk about some provocations for all of you as you think about your strategies to navigate through the talent situation in 2023. Very real near-term uh, provocations. We're going to move to talk about what should you do, five steps we think you should take to improve the resiliency of your talent pipeline, make it more future-proof. And towards the end, we will have some time to take some questions. So I would encourage all of you to use the Q&A window to submit your questions as we go through this discussion. And if you have anything uh, interesting to say, share from your experience, comment, uh, feel free to use the chat window. So uh, let's start with a quick poll then. You know, uh, this is an interesting question. We asked it a few months back also. So we want to ask it again. As of today, what is your organization's position on the tech talent situation? And you'll see we have a full spectrum of uh, options out there for you, uh, right from those who are implementing layoffs to continuing to hire versus you know, don't, don't feel that this is a procession situation at all. I can see uh, a lot of responses are starting to pour in. Let's give and, a few more seconds. It's going to be interesting to see Rohit. Last time we had the exact same questions, I think in September of last year. Yes. And it looks like the major theme 
is going to look very similar. And, and I know we're going to, as we end the poll, we'll probably kind of talk through what the results were and compare them with uh, what we had last time. Let's maybe give this another 10 seconds. But I think the general patterns have stayed parallel, right? And um, I think we can go ahead and close the poll now, publish the results, and then also get to what we saw last time. So what you see on the screen in terms of the orange numbers are what we had last time, which is you know slightly over half said, hey, we want to continue hiring, but reduce hiring demand. Today's poll has that number at 49%, right? So still continue hiring. So that remains the, the largest. The second largest was have already frozen or plan to freeze hiring. And that's at 24% versus the 16% we had. So I do see a sentiment shifting in terms of the bullishness of hiring. What's also interesting is that um, on the flip side, the last theme, don't think recession will strike in 2023. It was 11% last time, it's up to 15% this time. So general sentiment, I would say, still fairly consistent over the last four or five months. Um, some changes, though, in terms of the top two areas where more people are kind of either planning or implementing some forms of layoffs or have frozen hiring. But it does look that an overwhelming not an overwhelming, but a majority of people are continuing their, their hiring efforts. And um, it's it's always good to see how that how that pulse evolves. Rohit, anything from your standpoint? No, but it's it's the interesting part that you said, Jim, this period is from the middle ground, while some have moved towards implementing layoffs, some have also solidified the opinion that they don't see slowdown in their respective sectors. So I think the clarity seems to be emerging a little bit more. Yeah. So, yeah, so let's let's just move forward and see, you know, just do a bit of a retrospective recap and, and look through the different components of what, what's happened, right? And um, one of the issues that we, issues, challenges, use your word, that we see is that people tend to think in short time intervals. And I think it's important to kind of put things into a broader perspective. And we now believe that we are entering a fifth phase of uh, actions when it comes to the tech talent environment and you know what we think of the economy. Phase one started three years ago, right? Um, as we as we think about the lockdowns of 2020, a lot of global uncertainty, job cuts, furloughs, so that happened. No one to revisit that again. Phase two, we did see that there was some layoffs, there were hiring freezes, hiring surges uh, that happened simultaneously. Knowledge work saw a surge in hiring, tech hiring saw a surge in hiring, which kind of then resulted in what we saw through most of 2021 and the first half of 2022, which was the great resignation phase, right? So pent up demand, very high attrition, inflation was through the roof. Everyone kind of felt that the talent market was red hot. As we think about Q3 and Q4 of last year, you know, all of the noise around the recession came through. Uh, we started to see some signals of people slowing down. We started to get some news of the layoffs that the tech sector wanted to do. And then now it seems that all we potentially hear is noise around uh, technology companies not hiring aggressively, in fact, laying off people. It's not just situated with technology, the consensus seems to be, hey, there's some relief in the talent situation, right? Attrition has started to stabilize, but interestingly, some hard to get skills are still hard to get, right? And that's what we wanted to unpack today, whether the talent war, as we've called it, is it over? Is it just a temporary phase? and unpack some of these decisions. Headline, we don't think it's over. Sorry, Rohit, jumping the gun. Uh, and, and also we don't, we don't feel that structurally some of the challenges we've seen are going away. 
just some of the boundaries of where those skirmishes are going to happen are going to change. But for new age, full stack skills, digital skills, I do think that the challenges will remain. We'll just get a bit of a breather over the next few months. And then, so, Jimit, yeah, you gave the you know big message already, and we'll unpack that. Uh, while we have focused today is on tech talent, I want to take us on a short tangent and then quickly close that. Is that uh, a lot of our listeners today, while tech talent is important for them, they may also have more diverse needs. So this is the, this uncertainty, this curiosity is expanding beyond that. Yep. Even in a lot of operations segments, even in a lot of voice segments, and not necessarily limited to niche skills only, we are still seeing a lot of challenge in hiring and retention continuing while, uh, you know, the macroeconomic situation around it changes. So it, it, it's really confusing. And I think there's a two different worlds of the expectations looking at microeconomic factor and the reality on the ground, uh, people who people who are dealing with it in terms of the talent acquisition and retention situation. So really, really, you know, uh, frustrating uh, for, for many in, in the conversations I've had. Uh, but yeah, take, take us through Take us through the data you have, Jim. No, and 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 I think as we as we look at the the some of the statistics on the next page, right? What we do see is that the services market and what we look at as the IT BPS, so technology and operations industry, uh, for a long period of time, we saw that this was kind of closely mirroring the uh, GDP of major economies. So strong correlation. I will tell you that the tech services, business process services sector follows the GDP in a slightly counter cyclical manner with a lag, right? Counter cyclical in the sense that, you know, when the GDP is expanding, you see more, um, more focus on internal work. This is, this is the, the overall services industry across internal and external. During times of pressure after lag, we actually see the situation improve. And that's what we saw in the post-pandemic era. But through most of 21 um, and 22, we started to see the broader divergence between the GDP curves and what was going on with the services sector. Obviously, as I said, there's a slight lag. So now we've seen that there's a reduction in demand from a growth perspective. And uh, we do suspect that this, that this reduction in demand will happen, but we don't think it's going to fundamentally close the gap. Yes, the gap will likely narrow over time, but we do think that the services sector has been largely resilient and is expected to be so as we, as we go along. Right? And with that, Amir, I know it's, uh, Rohit mentioned this, right? It's, it has been a tale of two cities. So if you look at some of the announcements and if you look at some of the data, what are you picking up? Absolutely, Jamit. Uh, so if I, if I look at some of the recent announcements, right? And, uh, and like, uh, you know, the playoffs has been the buzz of the town, of the tech town, and in fact, the entire talent market, right? For the last few months, if I only look at the top big four tech employers, combined they have laid off more than 50K employees globally. And, uh, and this is actually a sizable portion. If I compare the same scenario with our previous webinar in September, six months back, there were a lot of announcements on planning to lay off, putting a hold on hiring. But fast forward to the current situation, we have seen a lot of layoffs. And, and if I talk about the reason, Jamit, so and maybe you can add a couple of more reasons if it comes to your mind. Uh, there have been you know uh, speculations around. One, one thing is very clear that uh, companies are... Uh, listing the economic slowdown and the lowering of demand as the main reason why they are laying off. Uh, another big reason which I, which I suspect is uh, the fact that they hired a lot of people on a very high premium price uh, in the previous phase when there was a lot of talent crunch going on, right? So that could be another reason why they have announced layoffs. And while these companies, they announce a sizable portion of the talent as layoffs, there are others who are actually trying to capitalize. So if it's crisis for one, opportunity for others, a situation like that. And uh, interestingly, if I talk about the nature of these companies who are still focusing on hiring, 
what i have observed is that most of these companies are smaller medium sized companies or startups who are actually trying to tap on these you know free talent in the market because these talent are coming from some big tech firms who have great experience in this industry so i think that's a good opportunity for the enterprises and even service providers to replenish their losses that they have suffered and uh, and yeah uh, and if i talk about some of the uh, recent announcements even even some big names have come up right recently uh, jamet i was uh, going through one of the article where fidelity mentioned that they are planning to have around 4 to 5000 employees even though the other companies are cutting down the jobs so i feel that uh, there are two sides of the coin still and uh, while on one side companies are laying off others are trying to capitalize on the situation yeah in in fact two observations right i was in i was in the bay area yesterday traffic in the bay area does not seem to suggest things have slowed down right so it's 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 a mystery right and i was speaking to the uber driver there trying to figure out so people are working from home the bin layoffs why is the traffic as bad as it was pre pandemic and so that that that's a personal peeve interestingly someone like fidelity i think just announced or hit what 7000 yesterday that they are planning to hire across geographies so i do think that this is not a let's just look at one headline and draw conclusions yes there is a surplus that the tech companies have been letting go off but at the same time we are seeing meaningful activities which are happening on the other side across other sectors people who weren't able to participate they're truly trying to buy into that dip that we are seeing into that market right now jivit right, just jivit. one observation coming from discussions with some of the recruiters uh, you know some trends that we have been trying to analyze is we we started looking at some trends on people who started highlighting that they've been laid off and how quickly some of them are going back or are going back into a job and a large portion was consumed back by the industry fairly quickly so I, i think there is a correction you know opportunity which is also at play here uh, amir how, how does how does this impact the overall demand supply gap situation you know in in key markets uh, how do you look at that right right so i think i think let us look at a very interesting analysis uh, on the next slide and see how the entire uh, demand supply gap has you know shifted so before we dwell deeper into the analysis on this slide Uh, I, would, I would just take few seconds to explain the nature of the graphs. I'm pretty sure some of the attendees have seen this from our old webinars. Uh, so basically, we're trying to uh, assess the relative market based on three crucial factors, which is attrition, growth, and the unmet supply demand. And if I look at the color coding of the countries, we have just tried to estimate, you know, based on the last six months, has there been any improvement in these areas? And if I look at this graph. a clear yes there has been some improvement uh, in several countries if i look at us mexico india definitely there has been improvement across more than one dimension either uh, attrition or unmet demand so somewhat uh, net net i would say the market has shown some relaxation when it comes to the traditional it services skills and and by traditional i mean uh, it development it infrastructure etc so yeah definitely there is some relaxation in the market uh, even even countries like uh, philippines indonesia colombia they have shown some improvement in either of these factors at least one area where they have shown some improvement but but rohit like you said again this boils down to the same thing right is the war for talent over we are looking at the analysis at the indicators that yes uh, the economy is slowing down the demand has reduced so does that mean the entire debate over the talent crunch is over well uh, if if i were to answer this question i would say a yes and a no a yes because all the leading indicators uh, all the analysis the demand supply gap they all suggest some relaxation in the overall talent market but on the other hand uh, to justify my no i would i would quickly ask roit a question do you feel that this will put a hold to the entire debate of uh, you know the talent war talent demand crunch or do you have some convincing evidence to suggest that the history might repeat itself again 
what do you think so, not not at all amir again i somehow you know uh, i i hear your optimism and your dual point of view but from everything that i'm hearing in my conversations or work with our clients i mean just look at this slide you said it has it has improved definitely it has you are showing it with your those blues and grays but when i still look at the absolute colors in those three icons i see a lot of red in there still so the situation is improving the gap is narrowing but the primary problem there is more demand than there is supply for skilled specific skilled resources that still remains right i'm still short of the finishing line i'm closer okay i feel like better but i'm not there so and then and that is the gap in the industry also right now in fact moving on to the next slide right you said history repeats itself some challenges right some very interesting and again you know we we are not we are not kind of here uh, doomsday you know uh, theory mongers but let's just look at the data right let's just look at the data from the last four years in the chart on the top you are looking at the headcount growth of the leading technology services providers those charts are for some of the key companies some of the biggest ones you read there if you look at what happened during the end of you know 20 uh 19 we kind of uh saw you know a certain dip starting to happen in 2020 kind of that growth dipped again it was the covid era but as you start looking at what happened in the following the subsequent and jumit said with regards to gdp and demand it demand but also look at the trends in the talent market itself the demand went down and then the demand went up again but when the demand went up in the middle period in the graph at the bottom the attrition it just skyrocketed i don't think i need to remind anybody of the horrible talent scramble situation right it several sleepless nights and uh desperate measures were taken but generally uh uh you know a, a slow down in demand was you know followed by a rapid aggressive hiring and that broke the market that created problems for everybody so again going back when there is a fundamental gap in the demand supply i think this may be and again not to not a doom state theory but personal opinion this may be a lull before the before the next storm and uh, hence you know we are going to talk about this but i i don't see the talent war as over uh jumit and anything you want to add as you uh take us through the five provocations we have today no i think i think it's um this is not unique to our sector if you go back to the um scramble for was it tulips back in the day right and uh, dutch tulips crypto texas housing market which i suffered through we see different flavors of irrational demand causing irrational behaviors i do think that some of the irrationality part is behind us but this is not going to be a situation where you know uh, so so we won't have a repeat of what we were seeing in late 21 early 22 but i do think that it's going to be important for companies to keep investing in what we consider is one of our most important resources which is human capital and with that i think it's going to be important for us to pivot the direction or pivot the conversation into what are some ideas provocations we have for you but before that maybe you know we had a poll for our uh, audience right uh, just to kind of capture what the top priorities are for uh, 2023 and you know in some ways you're going to see that some of our provocations linked to these themes so if if the if we could just stop the poll here interesting um what we are what we are seeing is it started off you know when the poll started it was like cost optimization number one driver right second was engagement and retention as the polls progressed 
cost optimization still the number one driver and uh, maybe can we publish the results for everyone um so yeah it's uh, cost optimization is number one when the poll started it was at 57 percent right now it's sitting at 36 percent engagement and retention so glad to see that this is still a big theme for people so it's 29 percent you know um, focus 29 percent as the top priority and then building a future talent pipeline focusing on upskilling is also very important right so um so yeah i think i think that's a good indicator of what's really going on in the in the landscape rohit any observations from you before we get to some of our yeah. what i find really surprising is Jimmy, the disconnect between number one and number five right so the cost optimization is a priority but uh productivity is still you know staying on the back burner so uh, we'll, we'll unpack that a bit more as we go but uh, you know, i find that very curious excellent okay amir um why don't you why don't you talk us through some of your findings on top skills right uh, so this uh, brings us to the first provocation of the day uh, as we move to the next slide uh, right so when we think about the first provocation uh, the talent demand supply mismatch for critical skills are there to stay even though we have seen in the previous slides a similar slide you know a couple of slides back that the overall uh, the talent demand mismatch for traditional skills that is it infra and it development has shown some relaxation but when we tried and do the analysis for the similar uh, geographies for the digital skills what we see that uh, it was surprising to see that these are not isn't as we predicted. As you can see uh, from the graph, you see a lot of red spots here, like countries like India, Philippines, Indonesia, Canada, even US uh, has red on the unmet demand side. So, so what we conclude from this is that although the overall tech talent uh, mismatch has shown some relaxation, but this is going to continue for the digital skills. And also you can see some of the roles or skills that we have listed which we expect to be, uh, you know, a trouble area for uh, enterprises and service providers moving ahead in 2023. And that should be on the watch list for us. Uh, if we talk about skills, uh, cybersecurity, cloud, AIML, automation, et cetera, these are definitely going to be a matter of crunch and a focus area. So, so what is the way forward, you know? Uh, how can we actually address and see uh, that we address to these needs and the skills that we are actually, you know, uh, pointing out here. So I think let us uh, see and find out in our next section what else we can do. You know, Fip, Fip, I, mean, I was reading a comment, right? And uh, uh, let's just stay on stay on the previous slide, right? The key headline. Uh, I was reading the a chat message, and it was about how a lot of external shocks, you know. Uh, with supply demand uh, disrupted, uh, the logistics so supply chain impacted, inflation, war, all of that is, of course, it is impacting companies' ability to plan the pipeline with a lot of certainty. Uh, but that's where our provocation for you is, are your reskilling initiatives taking center stage? Now, a few minutes back in the poll, we saw there is significant priority, which is great to see. Because what we saw in the previous, you know, dip and the madness that followed, companies that had prioritized upskilling, reskilling during the uh, dip were actually better off. They were more prepared. They had more fungible talent. So what we are uh, asking you is that clearly you saw the charts, you saw the gaps, even with reduced demand, it's all red. The talent, or wait, we qualify, the skilled talent is simply not there. What are you going to do? And that's why, as we move to the next slide, we see some data, more than 70% leading tech organizations right now, when we ask them, where is your future talent pipeline going to come from? They believe that more than you know, 20 to 40% of the current talent employed in the industry, and that's millions of FTEs, they don't have the skills needed 
in the next three to five years. One side, as you struggle to find people, we are talking about millions of people in the industry who are expected to become redundant. How are we solving a problem? You know, we are looking for people. We have people. How are we bridging the gap? That's where, when we look at the other side and talk to the workforce, only 29%, uh, sorry, just uh, staying, staying on slide number 16, when we look at the workforce, only about 29% are satisfied with the career opportunities in their organizations. In fact, 75% feel that they can't uh, upskill because of the lack of development opportunities. Now that's, that's another big disconnect, right? We talked about the disconnect in expectations from acquisition teams and the reality on the ground. Think about employer and employee disconnect. Employees feel they don't have that career path and employers feel they don't have the talent. And that's why I'm not surprised when 80% organizations say that they want to fulfill a significant portion of their talent needs from internal movements. Now, many companies know what to do. I don't think they are surprised when we say this message. We've been saying it for a while, but how do you do it? And that's where on the next slide, we talk about a three phase program. And then why we want to emphasize on that is number one, you need to assess the gaps. You need to plan. Now, all these shocks will be there. And can you completely anticipate them? Of course not. To what extent can you assess what are the gaps going to be based on your tech strategy changes? You don't know when the war is going to kick off, but you know which tech transformation you need and you're going to implement. Are you looking into your needs uh, more proactively, right? 33% organizations, more than that, do not have that approach. And we're talking about some Fortune 500 here. Second, the taxonomies have gone obsolete. They don't apply effectively anymore. And that creates a big gap. Organizations are defining the roles the way they used to describe. How has that changed? As a result, you're hiring on the basis of title. Skills are not always fitting. There's a lot of effort going to filter through not relevant candidates. So at multiple levels, inefficiencies are creeping in. And we have some data at the bottom, right? About 50% companies, they believe they don't have appropriate taxonomies. Suddenly the talent feels disconnected. They feel the uh, growth, the roles, the uh, skills that are clustered together, it just doesn't feel right. And then we hear how a lot of companies believe that the tech talent wants to work with the tech companies. Oh, there is a reason to that more than simply saying that Google and Amazon have a charm, you know, so, some, some things to learn from how they're defining the taxonomies differently. And lastly, don't leave it at that. Think about role development, proactive, structured investments, right? And that's another area where companies don't even know what skills they have. They know how many people they have in what department, with location, those Excel sheets are very religiously maintained, but in our research, we discovered, you know, and it, it's, it's sort of concerning that more than 40% companies don't have a regular updates to the repository of skills they have. So while they're looking for something outside, it might exist in some pockets, or they may be possible to find it in some pockets and bridge the gap internally. So that, that's our provocation to you on, on skilling uh, you know, initiatives and, uh, can we get back to Amir to take us to our next provocation? Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the next one. I'm, I wanted to kind of talk through a couple of things, right? So provocation one, we kind of established gap for critical skills will remain. Two, Rohit, what you spoke about is the need for upskilling and reskilling, right? Uh, upskilling and reskilling is a relatively new journey for the industry, and I'm glad that we are amplifying that, hey, don't pause your efforts on this. Number three, as we move to provocation number three, this is an appeal more than anything else. As an industry, the last 12 months, last 18 months, we really upped our efforts on employee engagement initiatives, right? And it would be a shame if we stopped focusing on those and started to cut back because let's recognize this is also cyclical. At some point, this is gonna go away. And the companies that will come out of this situation and not see a wave of attrition 
are the ones that are going to keep employment employee engagement initiatives front and center during the next um, months and quarters right so what do we what do we mean by that uh, yes we understand that there are pressures and if we kind of look at some of the data that's on the next page you know there are budget cuts they are real there is going to be the reality of layoffs in some situations where we might have over capacity big programs coming to close but if we go back and think about the companies that struggled versus the ones that struggled really hard one differentiator we also saw that in our top employers analysis was the inability to create the right value proposition was the inability to create the right employee engagement structures and let's face it if you look at some of the data that's existed based on our survey results as well as other talent market research that's out there a third of tech employees are still looking to change jobs right uh, but at the same time there's also factors which say here's why they would want to stay which is you know and almost 70% of employees believe that you know they deliver more if there was better appreciation and value prop within their company 70% of executives believe that you know better employee engagement creates better company success this group believes that you know employee engagement is a top priority right so i would say that yes there's a lot of ground to cover yes there's going to be pressures i don't expect people to be able to amplify their efforts during this time of economic uncertainty but let's work to preserve what we've created on employee engagement and not take a step back it's going to be tempting but i do think it's going to be a critical enabler the the npv so just thinking about the business case the productivity and real cost of attrition will go up if you just if you if you reduce these efforts if you can find ways to maintain them the roi is going to be very positive and and we have strong conviction in this so it's an appeal more than anything else sorry i'm getting a bit passionate about this but i do feel very strongly about this thesis um amir rohit anything on this one before we talk about the one that wasn't a priority for folks and and uh, uh, jimit the sun thinks that uh, uh, with the poll result that we see that we saw right now right so it emerged as the second biggest priority so i believe somewhere down the line uh, even our uh, even people and the leaders in our audience are also prioritizing engagement and like you said this is something which is there to stay it has to stay uh, and i think uh, as we move into a, you know a very steady state of hybrid somehow i feel that the data and the stats suggest that we have uh, weakened on these efforts is it this might be because you know there are less attrition you know we have talent flooding in the market but like you mentioned i think uh, this has to stay if we are uh, yet to do more with less and the talent we have right now over to jimit yep okay in the interest of time i'll keep us moving right so um here's the fourth one this is a bit more controversial uh, provocation number 4 um skills some emerging skills are going to be hard to find we need to invest in upskilling we need to keep our employee engagement focus alive as a talent leader we just keeping on asking for more from from a organization budgetary perspective but we aren't necessarily creating the right results and i do think it's important to bring back a conversation that took a back seat over the last 18 months or so which is the productivity conversation right and um you know organizations are wanting to do more with less and so how do we really move to the right productivity conversation right and we do believe that this is the time to take another holistic look at productivity we've had this conversation with y'all before so if i if i look at what's really going on with productivity there's two themes that i wanted to unpack here right so uh, as we as we move to the next slide um 
I'll, I'll probably start with the right hand side, right? And 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 it's been it's been fascinating to see what's really going on in the technology sector as a leading indicator of what's to follow. So um, the companies that are seeing reductions in force are the ones that are also amplifying efforts of employee productivity, right? Uh, you see that in, in Google, the simplicity sprint to gather employee feedback on efficiency, you know, uh, Salesforce, Mark Benioff talking about how productivity seems to have taken a backseat. Uh, Mr. Musk's got lots of things going on, won't go there, but, you know, unnecessary meetings and meeting overload is definitely one of the things that we are seeing a lot of companies go after. We're just just reading another news report where a company eliminated 322,000 person hours per month just by eliminating repeat meetings that did not make sense. So I think there's a, there's a very important discourse that needs to happen on productivity. And productivity is not just about the iceberg that you see on the left where, hey, let's, let's try to optimize costs and our people are slacking. I don't think that's the conversation we need to have. The issue needs to kind of get into some of the areas that are below the surface, which is how are some of these impacting quality? How are some of these impacting speed of output? We are not really seeing all of that innovation. We're not seeing effective performance management, what's really happening with employee morale. We have no doubt that some of this is going to start people to rethink their contours of the hybrid work environment. It started to happen already, right? More people are saying, we need more collaboration, so let's bring people back. We still convince that the future should be hybrid, but some companies are using this as an opportunity to change the rule book a bit, bring more people back in, potentially even use that to drive attrition, that's fine. But I do think the conversation needs to move to holistic productivity, not just, hey, let's get more for less. And the value prop of productivity is to get better speed, better innovation, better quality. And I think that's going to be an important conversation for us to have. So how do we do that, right? Um, as, we, as we move to the next page, it's, it's essentially six things that become important. Let's not think of productivity as a simple input versus output conversation. Let's not assume productivity is a requirement for our employees. I think as talent leaders, as, as execs, it's our responsibility to create the right organizational structure. So break the silos, which create friction. Make sure you have the right talent and skills. If your pyramid is very leveraged, you know, lots of entry level resources, you should expect a productivity there. So do you have the right pyramid, you know, the right skills to create the right output? Let's make sure we're creating the right technology ecosystem. We have the right processes, um, you know, delivery locations. And, and there's been a lot of conversation about, hey, is productivity possible in distributed models? Is productivity possible in offshore models? At the peak of the pandemic, we were all convinced it is. I don't think the fundamentals have changed, but I do think it's important to go back and re-examine that whole location footprint to see what's, what's going on. And then finally, one of the things that did suffer is this issue of reusability knowledge sharing. So as, as talent leaders, we need to make sure that we are creating a mindset of reuse in our productivity journeys. So let's not assume productivity is a narrow conversation of, hey, employee, you're not putting in the 12 hours they expected you to. Let's make sure we're putting in place the right enablers for that productivity to happen. And with that, you know, uh, Rohit, I know I spoke about locations. So, uh, what's your what's your view on locations? No, oh, sure, Jamit, and, and uh, I see a very interesting question on uh, kind of the productivity and scaling. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take that. I addressed a few uh, on chat because I see the conversation is stretching. We will not be able to take a lot of live questions at the end. Uh, but one question is: uh, companies are creating universities to accelerate talent pipeline, and a formalized scaling program, definitely yes. We see this very prevalent in terms of the large tech services providers, some of the larger uh, IT uh, captives, uh, you may call our developments, offshore development centers. They have also started this. 
in fact uh, in, in increasingly in locations like india vietnam philippines we see tie ups between uh, educational institutes and uh, uh, companies not just to recruit but also to train so all, all of that is happening and we are going to see you know uh, we are seeing some of that actually reap very good good results uh, talking about the last provocation for the day right so organizations need to reevaluate the locations optimization option uh, and then the arbitrage sustainability that that's again we saw earlier cost optimization is one of the key pillars so how's that showing up in the location strategy right let's look at some data on the next page uh, we compared we did not go far back but we compared some very recent shifts right in the last 3 years between 2019 and 2022 where companies have been establishing you know the focus on offshore is continuing to increase and we are highlighting that because 2016 2019 there was a period of amplified messaging around need to bring you know stuff back 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 to the uh, onshore or business markets as of today in the last few years more more and more use of uh, what we say offshore is the low cost locations kind of uh, apac uh, south america so these locations right and furthermore within these locations there was a strong trend of companies going to tier 2 tier 3 locations expanding new footprint beyond tier 1 uh, which gives access to new talent pools but also helps you optimize the cost portfolio take advantage of the low cost of living uh, the gaps may not be very high across all tier 2 tier 3 locations but there is a tangible saving there this has slightly dipped in the last 3 years i want to explore that but it's still a significant trend you know it's not like it's 60% is coming down to 40 it's still operating in the same range so tier 2 tier 3 remains a priority however uh, the slight dip is also caused with that again going back to the talent scramble situations companies wanted to scale faster and there is a bit of a investment a uh, longer curve that sometimes happen when you go to a relatively uh, greenfield market to establish yourself create the ecosystem Uh, create more maturity in the market so uh, banking on proven locations uh, became a bit of a safer option so we saw a bit of a change there whether we talk about the cost proposition or the talent proposition the pivot keeps shifting uh, if we had taken the same poll last year talent was number 1 cost was nowhere to be seen budgets were double tripled uh, you know and then then uh, when we look at uh, today cost showed up at top talent is not far off so the pivot keeps shifting but the focus stays same moving to more offshore locations uh, moving deeper into kind of the larger metro tier one cities and then you know the other locations right a question that has been asked all this while is that as the pivot shifts to talent is cost arbitrage important is cost arbitrage sustainable this conversation kind of died down a few years back but in the last couple of years has really surfaced in the last few months let's look at some data on the next page right so and and there's some uh, humble uh, acceptance here you know kind of going to page number 25 here uh, we're talking about uh, uh, our kind of uh, can can we shift to the next page we're talking about uh, the arbitrage uh, uh, chart chart thank you uh, back in 2009 and every group has been doing you know uh, this market uh, tracking for several decades now so back in 2009 we said under the most optimistic scenario the location uh, the cost arbitrage will sustain for more than 25 years but there were scenarios which restricted it right we are not into that 25 period window but see where we are today 13 years down the line we still see almost similar arbitrage available that was there so a lot of inflation in these offshore locations has been cushioned with exchange rate movements inflation in other markets and if you look at the prediction for the next decade taking us to that approximately 25 year mark more or less the arbitrage is continuing so we are kind of correcting our posture from 13 years back and saying it was not a 25 year window it is a much longer much more sustainable window 
in the arbitrage is continuing. Uh, this is where you saw a little bit of clunky change in the slide. We offer to all our listeners today, if we go back to the, uh, to the uh, you know, offer for the buy-side enterprises today, the slide, I think it's one before, uh, pick, pick an area, pick a function that is important to you, pick a location uh, from the list of locations here, and we will do the analysis and tell you uh, for your particular services that you're interested in in those locations, what's the uh, you know, talent and risk perspective. Uh, so you can check a location of your choice and get, get the complimentary analysis uh, available to you. You will get the link in the window and you'll get some details in the post webinar uh, commentary uh, follow up as well. So watch out for that. Quickly wrapping us up, uh, you know, in terms of the content for today, uh, I'll jump to the slide 28 and wrap up with the five action items. So we've spoken about all of this. So what do you need to do? One, identify and prioritize critical skill segments. I may spoke about a few, the list is longer, but prioritize where your investments need to be. Second, invest in upskilling, reskilling, not enough talent, demand is increasing, you have to do something about it internally. Third, the appeal Jimit made, employee engagement is important. There are consequences if you make some choices to uh, at this stage, so think about that. Uh, number four, productivity, not priority in the five items listed today for this group, but can you do more with less? That took a backseat. Is this the time to reinvest? And lastly, location optimization. What's the right mix for you? What gives you arbitrage? What gives you access to talent? What do you think about that? With that, Javit, uh, lesser time than uh, we uh, wanted to give you at the end, but uh, please uh, take us through uh, some of the question and answers. Yeah, no, I think, I think yeah, please send us your questions uh, through chat. I know there've been some that we've, we've answered overall um, as well. There's one that kind of came through, which is around, the, the usage of the university model in some ways, has that been effective, right? And I don't know, Rohit, if you have a point of view, people have put together these uh, universities to accelerate the flow of talent pipeline. And even for upskilling, do we see the strategy to be effective? Your point of view on this? Oh, definitely, Jumit, and I mentioned this briefly. Uh, a lot of tech services providers have done that or are tying up but increasingly more of the development centers, IT uh, captives are also doing that. And uh, I'll keep this short, the answer can be long, but definitely effective and more control over the pipeline, more stickiness with the candidates because they're kind of trained for you and lower time to productivity because you are kind of training them specific to your demands. So they hit the ground, you know, running or, or faster than uh, external talent. Yeah. I'd say that the university concept has also been important for that arbitrage sustainability that you showed. Because in some ways, you know, uh, the big driver there was foreign exchange. So the forex impact was roughly a 4.7% compounded annual growth rate over three years. Here's what that's meant for the industry. And this is something that's surprising to people. Uh, in the past, from a salary perspective, you go back to 2008, 2009, people were paying roughly $7,000 per entry-level resource. That number today is probably closer to $6,000 per entry-level resource. So in real terms, you're paying lower now than what you were paying 13 years ago because of exchange, because of the fact that these universities have been very uh, successful, right? I also know that there was a question on tier one, two, and three cities, which I know you've, you've answered. Yes, we will be publishing this, this online. Uh, I did want to take a moment to also kind of talk about a, um, an exciting new webinar that is to follow, right? This is going to happen, I believe, on March 14th, which is going to be all about where are the best locations. We have some exciting announcements and some exciting new ways of analyses that we're going to show here. So for those of you who are really interested in getting to the, um, the webinar, right? Uh, you know, it's on the previous page. 
you 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 can you can join us and register for that and we look forward to kind of hosting you for it so i think i think we're largely out of time yes you will have a copy of these slides i know we answered some q and a live so look forward to uh, hosting you all again and thanks so much keep sending those questions and we and we we will be in touch um, good luck with these interesting times